Hi, welcome back to our YouTube channel. I am Chad Nichols, MPC Judge, IFBB Pro. And today we got a special treat for you. We have Dr. Jeremy Linicky, who is the leading rush, uh, researcher on BFR training, which I am absolutely fascinated with. So having him today with us is really, I mean, it's a treat for me. So we're really going to enjoy that. So let's get right into it. Um, so why don't you give us a little bit of background about, you know, your studies and stuff and what got you into this particular topic? Sure. <clears throat> well, first, thanks for having me on. Uh, I, I appreciate the invitation. Um, I also appreciate the kind words. Uh, there are certainly a, uh, a lot of people who do a lot of good blood flow restriction research outside of our group, um, mm -hmm. but we, we do do a lot of it as well. Um, I got into blood flow restriction probably uh, almost 10 years ago. Um, I was reading some of the literature. Um, well, I was finished on my undergraduate studies and I was reading some of the papers. Uh, and, and to be honest, when I, when I read it, you know, I wasn't sure if I was really understanding what I was reading because it seemed a little counterintuitive to me. Mm -hmm. uh, but then I went to Illinois. Um, I was doing a, an internship up there. Um, and I saw uh, Lane Norton uh, and a couple other people in the gym kind of trying this out. Um, and I was like, wow, maybe I was reading that correctly. Uh, <laughs> so we got to talking um, and I decided to, to really kind of start focusing on that. Uh, so that's really how I got, I got started. So that was 2007, 2008. Um, and yeah, from there I, I came back, I did my master's uh, with that, we were really focusing on kind of the practical blood flow restriction, which is probably what most of, of the, uh, your listeners are probably interested in. Right. Uh, so there's a lot of cool things that come from that, but there's obviously a lot of limitations because mm -hmm. uh, you don't know how to quantify pressure um, and things of that sort. Then went to Oklahoma, uh, where I became really interested in how to, how to apply this from a methodological perspective. What are some of the potential mechanisms, how this might be working? Um, and then came to Ole Miss and uh, have kind of extended that, look at different kind of pressure combinations, uh, high, low, and looking at different muscle mm -hmm. adaptations. Now, you're not just a, a science guy. You've actually used some of this. You're like, you've done some powerlifting, I believe some bodybuilding too. So you've, you've actually used this on yourself too, not just for your studies and things like that, correct? Sure. Yeah, I... I, 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 I did bodybuilding many, many moons ago. Um, yeah, I definitely enjoy minute, that. Many, many moons ago, you, you look like you're like 25, man. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I guess I competed maybe 13 years ago. Well, was the first time I did it. Uh -huh. um, and then I guess the last time was probably 2010, 2009, somewhere around mm -hmm. there. Um, then I got into some powerlifting. So yeah, no, I, I, I'm, I did bodybuilding. I really enjoyed that sport. I have appreciation for it. Uh, it was very, very mediocre, uh, but definitely uh, enjoy the sport. Same thing with powerlifting. Um, I think that's a, uh, has its own uh, kind of unique things that make it great, but definitely different than, than bodybuilding. But yeah, I've incorporated it in, in both of those, certainly. Yeah, so I guess kind of what I was alluding to, your your background in, in playing with those sports is kind of one of the things that probably lead you to your, your interest in it when you saw Lane doing it and other things like that, right? Yeah, certainly. Okay. Absolutely. Um, I guess one of the one of the first questions I want to ask, and it's it's probably the one of the biggest questions you've been asked for, the safety of it. I know when I first started using it way back about five years ago when I was uh, training, um, when Lane was training me and brought it into my workout program, I took it to my gym and just putting it on the looks you got, you know, for sure. everybody. And it's kind of interesting that even today, you know, five, six years later, you still get those looks in the gym. Is it safe? And I, I know a lot of questions or a lot of assumptions were that, oh, it looks like you could cause blood clots in there from the blood pulling. Let's go ahead and address that right now. Yeah, that's a that's a good point, and I think the uh, the safety. I, I think that's always uh, when I hear somebody ask about that, I'm actually very pleased because mm -hmm. it's like that's that's a that's a logical way to think. Um, mm -hmm. 
Um, yeah, I think the, the first thing to keep in mind is when we're applying that cuff or that wrap, uh, we're applying it for a very short period of time. Yeah. So we're applying it for minutes, not for hours. We're also only partially restricting blood flow. So blood flow is going into the muscle. There's just not a lot coming out. So I think that that's an important thing to keep in mind because people's first thought is blood flow is good. You're restricting blood flow, mm -hmm. therefore it's bad. Mm -hmm. um, and that would be very much true if we were restricting it for hours. Uh, we wouldn't want to do that. But that's not what we do with blood flow restricted exercise. Um, there are, as you mentioned, kind of two large concerns that people have. The first is, does it increase your risk of blood clots? Mm -hmm. Two, does it increase your risk of muscle damage? Mm -hmm. uh, so those are two big concerns. And I think the, the way to think about this is, if you do blood flow restriction uh, appropriately, does that increase your risk for blood clots? Does it increase your risk yes. for muscle damage over doing the same exercise without blood flow restriction? And the keyword, available keyword appropriately, right there, yeah. there right? Keyword right. appropriately. Appropriately, as well as does it increase your risk? Mm -hmm. uh, and the answer doesn't seem to be, it doesn't seem like it does increase your risk. So the reason why I, I think the second point is also important to emphasize, in addition to the appropriate comment, is because there will be people who do this. If you do a, have enough people exercising, there will be people who have muscle damage. Uh, there will be people who have uh, who will induce a blood clot. Uh, that happens, unfortunately, with just normal life. Mm -hmm. So the important question is, when I do blood flow restriction, do I increase that risk? Mm -hmm. And so far, it doesn't seem like you do. But yeah, applying it appropriately, as well as just understanding it doesn't increase the risk or it doesn't appear to. Well, it's like squats. Anytime you go under the bar, there's an inherent um, principle of risk getting hurt right there. You know, Absolutely. Of course, the, the more correctly you do it, the less the risk. The more incorrectly, the more the risk. So it's just kind of, should be kind of common sense that anything you do like that has those uh, risks involved. Um, so I do want to get in a little bit more into a few minutes about how to use it appropriately, but kind of since we're talking about safety and things like that and muscle damage, um, the next question really is, what about the thickness of the bands? Because the first thing that pops to my mind is any, any part of the muscle that is compressed by the band, you're probably going to lose something because you don't have that cell volumization going on there. I mean, is, is that accurate or am I overthinking there? Um, I, I think that I like the way that you're thinking. I think that pragmatically you might be overthinking it a little bit. Okay. Um, I, I'm not so sure about the thickness. Definitely the width. Well, I'm sorry. That's what I meant, the width. Could yeah, you okay. My bad. Yeah, because the width, some of them are really wide. Then you got the little medical tourniquets and there's tons of different kinds out there. It drives people crazy. What kind do I get? Yeah, I think that there's pros and cons to each, but ultimately I think the important thing to consider is assuming that you're, you're uh, not occluding blood flow completely, mm -hmm. my guess is, is that the adaptation is going to be pretty, very similar. Sure. Now, if we look at the, the, the literature on wide cuffs, meaning, you know, uh, 12 or 13 centimeters wide, mm -hmm. right, or a narrow cuff, which we think about typically in my world around five centimeters wide. Those if we look at that ones. Uh, that you can get I'm, still, I'm still talking about a cuff, but the, okay. yeah, the medical okay. ones are going to be even more narrow. Okay. okay. Uh, so the thing to keep in mind with that is the wider the cuff is, the lower the pressure that's going to be applied because it's displacing it over a wider, mm -hmm. uh, a wider area. The narrower the cuff, the higher the pressure that you need to apply. Now, that doesn't mean that because you have to apply a higher pressure, that that makes it better or worse than a wide cuff. It's just a function of the size of the cuff. Okay. Now, there is some data, and I think this is probably what, what's in your mind, um, in my mind as well, because I'm, I always think hypertrophy first. Exactly, uh, yes. <laughs> there, there is some data that suggests that underneath the cuff, there might be an attenuation of growth, meaning mm -hmm. that muscle growth will occur, but it might not occur to the same extent 
as as the the arm that's not under the cuff. So right. obviously, if we have an arm and we apply a wide cuff, that might cover a large portion of it. So the question is, do I does that limit the amount of growth that I have? compared to if I just use a narrow cuff, which is covering a very small range. There is some data that suggests that that's true, but I, I'm not overly convinced. Okay. Um, but I, but if, if, if that's something to, to be mindful of, then maybe you would, you would err towards using a more narrow cuff. Now, uh, in my world, where we try and set the pressure relative, mm -hmm. in the lower body, we tend to use a little bit of a wider cuff yeah. because we can't, the machine doesn't go high enough. If you have someone like you coming in that has a, a bigger limb, we're not going to be able know. to cut. You, you haven't seen my legs lately. <laughs> we're, we're not going to be I, able I to, to, to cut you off. Right. Yeah, but I yeah, I think there's a, the, I think in general, I, I, I think for the pragmatic person in the gym, I, I probably wouldn't think about it too much. Okay. So like when you see the bands out there, they've got those big blue ones. I'm not going to use the name that you see on Amazon. They're like that wide for your arms. Really, it, it's kind of splitting hairs about whether it's effective or not versus the smaller ones. Okay to go with that. You're still probably going to get about the same results. For the yeah. Purpose. Yeah, I, okay. I think so. I, my bias is always towards more narrow. Mm. Um, same just because I like we in our lab we find that it's we don't know why this is but in the upper body especially the narrow cuff seems to result in less discomfort than a wide cuff even applied to the same relative pressure now it's not a big difference but there is a difference um, so some people prefer and we found that most people prefer to use a narrow cuff so that doesn't mean anything but um, it, I, I think that Ultimately, it probably doesn't matter too much, but uh, yeah, my, my bias is certainly the narrow. Okay. Um, next question too is, now, because we talked about hypertrophy and stuff, BFR does work with for hypertrophy, but it also affects your strength gains or strength adaptations too, correct? It's not just hypertrophy, but strength as well. That is correct. Um, it does. So... When we think about uh, the adaptations that we see, the, the two common ones are the changes in muscle size, so the muscle mm -hmm. hypertrophy, the muscle growth, mm -hmm. and the change in strength. Mm -hmm. uh, those are two that people are typically trying to, to acquire. If we look at the literature and we look at low load exercise with blood flow restriction compared to the same exercise without blood flow restriction, the group that has the added restriction will, will see greater changes in muscle size and greater changes in strength. Mm. So that's important because that shows an effect of blood flow restriction. Yeah. Now the next question that people always have is how does that compare to just lifting heavy weights? And with muscle growth, the change in muscle size is almost always the same as, as high load exercise. Mm -hmm. Now strength is going to be a little bit less. Um, so it, you will get stronger, but not as strong as you would if you would be lifting heavy weights. Uh, but you will see the same change in muscle size. And, and that's, uh, uh, that's because lifting heavy is largely a skill. Mm -hmm. um, there's a big specificity component there. So, yes, yes it does increase both size and strength. Um, size will be very much similar to what you get with normal high load exercise. Strength will be a, a little bit less, depending on the complexity of the movement. Good deal. Um, the next question kind of is something that I really like because I'm an older guy. I mean, I'm be turning 50 here in about a year or so. So that I have really have to be careful about my joints, tendons, and things like that. So one of the my next question revolves around that as far as uh, using BFR training, what effect, if any, does it have on stuff like the tendons? Any yeah. anything there? Yeah. Uh, there was a study done several probably about 10 years ago that didn't really see an effect uh, of, of blood flow restriction on the tendon, but it, it was, there's a, there were some questions about whether or not the load was progressed, et cetera. Mm -hmm. uh, a more recent study suggests that maybe there is some adaptation at the tendon uh, with blood flow restricted exercise. There's not a lot of data on it. If I had to, to, to guess, 
Uh, and I don't study the tendons very much, so I have limited knowledge on that. Mm -hmm. it, it, it just seems to me that the tendon adaptation appears to predominantly be load dependent. Mm -hmm. uh, so if you, if you really wanted to remodel the tendon, my guess would be that you probably need at least some loading on that, that you might not get from low loads. Mm -hmm. But again, there is a recent study that suggests that blood flow restriction does do that. Uh, but kind of take I, with a grain of salt, basically. Yeah, I, I'd like to see a, a, a little bit more mm -hmm. on that. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think it's a good question uh, and uh, certainly an interesting one. Well, I can tell you one thing, my joints appreciate it. You yeah. know, and that's, that's one of the things since, you know, the last couple of years, I've put, been putting it a lot more into my workouts and stuff. And, or if, for example, after doing maybe a strength block or something like that, they start to get a little bit sore again. Cause you know, I'm getting up there in age and stuff like that. Sure. I know when I throw a little bit more of that in there, they, they seem to recover a little bit better, the joint soreness and what. But that leads me to the next question. Like I said, I, I throw a little bit more in there. During a week, let's say we take a specific exercise on a specific muscle. Let's just say uh, barbell curls, okay? Is there a limitation on how many times you could use it through the, throughout your week before you start to get into a place of diminishing returns? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'm not going to be able to give you an exact number, sure. uh, but I, I think discussing conceptually, I would 100% agree with that. Um, I think that if you're adding blood flow restriction into your workout for, let's say, you move into a block where you want to unload a little bit and still try and maximize a lot of that adaptation. If you are adding blood flow restriction in, I would probably take something else out. Yes. Um, in the sense of within a given session, the muscle can only respond to a certain point before you start just delaying your recovery. So I think that with blood flow restriction, you might be able to train a little bit more frequently throughout the week, but I wouldn't necessarily go crazy with it. I mean, if you're doing it two or three times a week, you're probably going to maximize largely what you're getting. But I, I think that's a very important point that you brought up because I think a lot of times, and I, I probably did this myself, um, I would do my normal workout where I'm just like, you know, just destroying myself, uh, you know, three or four exercises with a muscle group. And then I'm like, you know, I'll add blood flow restriction. Exactly. Like, there's, there's no way that's going to do it. Uh, well, oh, I would be no. shocked <laughs> if that did anything extra than what you had already done. Yeah. So I guess I try to tell people it's, it's, a, it's not a full on replacement of doing normal hypertrophy or strength exercises. It's a good, it's an, or should I say, it's an excellent tool in the tool belt. Yeah. But like you said, you can't overdo it. So if you're use, if you're typically doing like some sort of bicep work in, in a work in a workout, maybe three exercises, you want to throw blood flow restriction in there, take one of those out and maybe yeah. finish off with BFR. Yeah. I guess that would probably be the best way to go about it. Yeah, I think that makes sense. I, mm -hmm. I, I think as long as you're replacing and not just keep adding. Uh, because once the muscles kind of popped out on that response for that session, yeah. <laughs> adding more, you're just delaying recovery at that point. No, I agree. I like that. Okay, so uh, here was a question somebody asked, and I've actually seen this on a couple of other blogs and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, is there a euphoric effect? Because I can tell you when I get done with it, I almost feel like I'm on a little bit of a high for a while. So it's yeah. almost like I'm addicted to the feeling as much as what it does to the muscles. Yeah. About that. Yeah, I. There. We're getting into some wizardry here now. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to alchemy. Right. Uh, <laughs> no, I, I. I do think that there. That's obviously something very difficult to quantify. Now, mm -hmm. one of the things that might be related to that, and it's something that we have been trying to test. We haven't been able to see it, but you know, it could have been how we were trying to implement it. Uh, but. One of the ways that blood flow restriction is, is starting to be used in the clinical world, at least in the research clinical world, is using blood flow restriction prior to physical therapy mm -hmm. uh, in the sense of you're almost alleviating or reducing some pain and discomfort, which will allow you to do maybe get a little bit more out of your therapy. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, so it may have a, like an analgesic effect. Uh, so... You know, there's a lot of reasons why that might might occur. You have something called, 
I can't remember exactly what it's called, but essentially discomfort and pivoting discomfort. Mm -hmm. um, yes. And so, yeah, those are a, a little bit different, but I think that it might work under kind of a, a similar realm where, you know, you have some reductions in, uh, like, I guess yours, it would be uh, an improvement in, in, in sensation, but this is yeah. the opposite. But yeah, I, I do feel like it may be capable of, of changing your feelings. So to well, speak. I'm telling you, yeah. it, sure, it sure seems like, and I know what there's several people that we train that are like, we're getting to the end of the workout and they're beat and they're tired and just hurting the stuff. And then we'll go through a blood flow restriction and they're in the, they'll come out with a, almost like a sigh of relief and not because the workout's done. It's just because the, the way you feel after it. I mean, I don't know. It's hard. It's really hard to explain, but I want to go back to what you said about the physical therapy. So let me get this straight. They were doing a little BFR before they went into their actual physical therapy session. Like, right. like, like kind of like, you know, before you, you'll warm up before you go work out. It's kind of in that same sense. In, in a sense. Yes. Now that's interesting. Those, those there needs to be a lot more work certainly sure. in that area. Uh, but there, there, there are some, some potential clues in the past couple of years that there might be something to that, that, that analgesic effect. So you have to follow uh, that. Yeah. Yeah. Very, I, very I, interesting. That's one of the things I am very interested in because if you have people who, you know, they, they, they can't actually get a lot out of the therapy because of they're limited by pain or whatever, if you can try and alleviate that, then that might be good. Or some people might be of the opinion that maybe that's not so good. Right. Um, well, it, it kind of hit home with me because years ago, before I, I started training the new bodybuilding, I um, tore my meniscus and had to have a partial partial taken out of my left knee. And when I went to physical therapy, the pain was so uh, unbearable that I, I stopped going yeah. I did, because it just it hurt too damn much and kind of gave up for a while before I finally went back and fought through it. But if that were the case, what you're talking about, that doing that ahead of time might have got me through that uh, those sessions and stuff. So again, that's kind of why I'm really gonna be following that. That's a really interesting point to look at. I know it's probably still way down the road. Yeah. Like that door is just probably just now kind of opened a little bit, but very interesting stuff. Yeah, and I obviously and importantly, I'm not a clinician, mm -hmm. uh, but I but I, I think that you know the the reason why it probably needs a lot more discussion is because uh, on one hand you might go well you reduce the pain and now you can do it but some people might argue uh, that maybe that pain is actually a, doing something that's very positive exactly telling you well back up buddy yeah, yeah I, can so, see that. I can see that but, but I, I'm definitely interested in the concept yeah same same so let's go back to the physical therapy I think I remember one point um, let me back up a little bit there's a lot of sports teams, professional organizations are starting to use this. I believe, if I remember correctly, I read one time, I think the Houston Texans was one of the first big organizations that used it in their like rehab or physical therapy program. Is that accurate? Yeah. And now I would say that, um, I would say that most people probably are. Certainly all the major schools in D1 probably are. Mm -hmm. I know that Ole Miss is. Um, I think the you have you have soccer clubs like Manchester United, mm -hmm. uh, Barcelona. Uh, they're at least using it on some athletes. Mm -hmm. I know that. Uh, but yeah, uh, I would say that the Houston Astros are probably well, are the Houston Astros. The Houston Texans. <laughs> Texans <laughs> uh, were were probably one of the first. I think Johnny Owens was 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 key in, in moving that kind of into that world. Um, but yeah, I think that they've used it some. I think that. Dwight Howard has used it in the NBA for, for reasons that you were kind of saying earlier. It's like he, he wants to try and get a workout, but he doesn't want to spend a lot of time recovering in the gym. He wants to recover from that for, for the actual sport. Exactly. Um, so, yeah, I, I definitely think that, you know, it's moving more towards in the clinical world, but it's also moving more towards in the actual sports in the United States, certainly. That's a good thing. Hey, and you got to be proud of that, man. That's your work that's going on there, dude. Yeah, no, a lot other, but still, you kind of you brought it out there in the first place, man. I love that. Well, I appreciate that. You know, it's definitely it's definitely very interesting. It's very it's very cool. Uh, but again, yeah, there's there's lots of people from a lot of places doing a lot of good work. Mm -hmm. 
but yeah, it is cool when you see some people uh, up, up upstairs in the gym, you know, doing some of that practical restriction. It's like, I wonder where you, you know, where you got that from. <laughs> exactly. Um, so, you got to, you know, you have to turn around and walk away with a little smile on your face when you see yeah. or read an they, article, some big organization or a, some big sports star stuff is talking about it. I mean, it's good though, man. That's really good. Yeah.